We all know the story of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, the forced labor, the inhumane treatment of men, women, and children, and the eventual abolition of the slave trade. But what many of us don't know is that the abolition of the slave trade in the early 19th century led to the creation of a new and even more sinister aspect of slavery, sex farms and slave breeding farms. The goal of these farms was simple, to produce more slaves. Slave owners realized that they could no longer import slaves from Africa, so they turned to breeding them like animals. They would carefully select which slaves would mate with each other based on their physical attributes, health, and even intelligence, in the hopes of producing the strongest and most profitable offspring. Slave breeding farms were located throughout the southern United States, with some estimates suggesting that there were as many as 70 in operation at the height of their popularity. These farms were often run by wealthy plantation owners who saw slave breeding as a lucrative business opportunity. But the horrors of slave breeding farms did not stop there. In some cases, plantation owners would set up sex farms, where slaves, often young girls, were forced to engage in sexual activity with other slaves or with the plantation owners themselves. The offspring of these forced sexual encounters were also seen as profitable commodities and were often sold off at auctions to the highest bidder. The true extent of these practices is difficult to quantify, as records were often destroyed or deliberately hidden, but it is estimated that thousands of slaves were forced to participate in these breeding programs, resulting in countless atrocities and human rights violations. In this video, we are going to reveal 10 of the most horrific facts of slave breeding and sex farms in the United States. These facts may be uncomfortable to hear, but it's important to acknowledge the brutality and inhumanity of slavery in all its forms. But before that, hit the subscribe button to stay on this channel for more content like this. Fact number one. Enslaved women were seen as breeding machines and impregnated by several men. One of the most disturbing facts about sex farms during slavery is that enslaved women were seen as little more than breeding machines. Plantation owners and overseers saw them as a means of producing more enslaved people to increase their wealth and power. In order to achieve this goal, enslaved women were often forced to have sex with several men, regardless of their own desires or consent. This practice was particularly prevalent in the Deep South, where the climate and soil were well suited to the cultivation of cotton and the demand for enslaved labor was high. Enslaved women on these plantations were often subjected to brutal physical and sexual abuse, with no hope of escape or redress. They were seen as property, rather than human beings, and their bodies were treated as such. The practice of forced breeding was not limited to the Deep South, however. It was also common in other regions of the country, including the Chesapeake Bay area and the Upper South. Plantation owners in these areas also saw enslaved women as a means of increasing their wealth and power, and used them accordingly. The evidence for the forced breeding of enslaved women can be found in a number of historical sources. Plantation records, for example, often include references to enslaved women who were breeders or breeding stock. These records also reveal the number of children produced by these women, as well as their age, health, and other relevant information. In addition to plantation records, there are also numerous slave narratives that document the experiences of enslaved women who were forced to breed. One such narrative is that of Harriet Jacobs, an enslaved woman who lived in North Carolina in the mid-19th century. In her memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Jacobs describes the horror of being forced to have sex with her owner in order to produce children. Fact number two. Female slaves were forced into sexual relationships with their owners or overseers. Sexual abuse of female slaves was widespread during the period of American slavery. Slave women were not only subjected to forced labor, but also to sexual exploitation by their owners and overseers. This practice was not limited to any particular region or plantation, but it was prevalent throughout the American South. The first evidence of sexual abuse of female slaves can be traced back to the transatlantic slave trade. Female slaves were often taken captive and forced to endure the long and arduous journey across the Atlantic in cramped and unsanitary conditions. During this journey, slave women were subjected to sexual abuse by the crew members and the other male slaves. Once in the American South, female slaves were subjected to even more sexual abuse, 
This abuse took many forms, including rape, forced sexual relationships, and prostitution. Owners and overseers would often take advantage of their power and authority to coerce slave women into sexual relationships. These relationships were often violent and non-consensual, and many slave women were impregnated as a result. The children born from these forced sexual relationships were not considered the children of their fathers, but rather the property of their mother's owners. This meant that these children were also slaves and could be sold or traded just like any other commodity. This practice was particularly common in the Upper South, where slaves were bred for sale to the Lower South. One example of this practice can be found in the story of Sally Hemings, a slave woman who was owned by former U.S. President Thomas Jefferson. Hemings was forced into a sexual relationship with Jefferson, and she gave birth to six children, four of whom survived to adulthood. These children were not recognized as Jefferson's children during his lifetime, but DNA evidence has since confirmed their paternity. Another particularly disturbing example of sexual abuse is the case of Celia, a slave woman who was owned by Robert Newsom in Missouri. Newsom repeatedly raped Celia, and when she became pregnant, he refused to acknowledge the child as his own. When Celia killed Newsom in an act of self-defense, she was tried and convicted of murder and hanged. This case highlights the brutal reality of sexual abuse and violence that many slave women faced in the American South. Fact number three, the offspring produced on sex farms were separated from their families and sold as soon as they were weaned. The practice of separating families during slavery was widespread, and it was not uncommon for enslaved children to be sold away from their parents. However, on sex farms, this practice was particularly prevalent. Enslaved women who were forced to breed were often impregnated by men who were not their husbands or partners. As a result, the children produced on sex farms were not part of a nuclear family unit, but rather a product to be sold for profit. According to historical records, many plantation owners saw the sale of enslaved children as a lucrative business opportunity. The price of an enslaved child varied depending on factors such as age, gender, and health, but they were generally sold for a higher price than adult enslaved people. This was because the children had the potential to grow up and become productive laborers, as well as future breeders themselves. In many cases, enslaved children were sold at public auctions, where they would be separated from their mothers and other family members. These auctions were often traumatic for both the enslaved people being sold and those who remained behind. In his book, The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, historian Edward E. Baptist describes the emotional pain that families experienced when they were separated. Enslaved people wailed and moaned, sobbed and screamed, and many of them ran to the edge of the auction platform, reaching for children or parents or lovers who were being sold away from them. The separation of families on sex farms had long-lasting effects on the enslaved people involved. Children who were sold away from their mothers often faced a lifetime of trauma and loss, and parents who were forced to give up their children lived with the pain of that separation for the rest of their lives. Fact number four. Some plantation owners would offer rewards to enslaved men who could impregnate the most women. It may seem unimaginable to think that a person could be rewarded for impregnating multiple women, but this was a reality for some enslaved men on sex farms during slavery. Plantation owners would offer incentives to enslaved men who could produce the most offspring, which would be sold for profit. This practice perpetuated the dehumanization of enslaved people and further cemented their status as property rather than human beings with agency and autonomy. In some cases, Plantation owners would even go so far as to pit enslaved men against each other in a competition to impregnate the most women. This not only caused harm to the enslaved women who were forced to participate in this system, but also created a toxic environment among enslaved men who were forced to compete with each other for the approval of their enslavers. One example of this can be found in the diary of a plantation owner named James Hammond who owned several plantations in South Carolina during the mid-1800s. In his diary, Hammond detailed his efforts to breed enslaved people for profit and boasted about the fertility of his enslaved women. He wrote that he offered rewards to the enslaved men who could impregnate the most women, stating that it was a great stimulus for them.
This type of behavior is not only morally reprehensible, but it also had lasting consequences for the enslaved people who were forced to participate in the system. The offspring produced in this way were often sold as soon as they were weaned, leading to the separation of families and further dehumanization of enslaved people. Fact number five. Enslaved women who were deemed to be good breeders were often treated better than those who were not. With the abolition of the slave trade, enslavers turned to women to expand the numbers of their slaves. During this time, women were viewed as reproductive machines, and their ability to bear children was a significant factor in determining their value. Enslaved women who were deemed to be good breeders were highly valued, and plantation owners often treated them better than those who were not. According to historian Deirdre Cooper Owens, plantation owners would use various criteria to determine which women were good breeders. Some factors included age, physical attributes, and fertility rates. Enslaved women who met these criteria were forced to have sex with male slaves, often against their will, and were then closely monitored throughout their pregnancies to ensure that they produced healthy offspring. Plantation owners often provided better living conditions and food to enslaved women who were good breeders. They would also give them preferential treatment in terms of work assignments and punishments. This was because the offspring produced by these women were more valuable and profitable for the plantation owner. One example of this can be seen in the life of the famous abolitionist, Harriet Jacobs. Jacobs was enslaved in North Carolina and was forced to have two children with her owner, Dr. James Norcom. She was deemed a good breeder and was treated relatively well compared to other enslaved women on the plantation. However, Jacobs refused to have any more children with Norcom and chose to hide in a small attic space for seven years to avoid his advances. Despite the preferential treatment that some enslaved women received, they were still subject to the brutal conditions of slavery. They were still considered property and were forced to have sex against their will. Fact number six. Slave breeding was a profitable business for slave owners and seen as a way to increase the owner's wealth. The breeding of enslaved people allowed plantation owners to increase their wealth by producing more enslaved people without having to pay for additional labor. Plantation owners often kept detailed records of the children born on their farms, noting their age, sex, and parentage. These records served as a way for owners to keep track of their assets and to calculate the value of their property. Children born to enslaved mothers were often sold at auction, with the price being determined by a number of factors, including their age, health, and sex. The profitability of the breeding of enslaved people can be seen in the records like that of Thomas Thistlewood. The Jamaican plantation owner kept meticulous records of his breeding practices that would be revealed centuries later. Between 1750 and 1786, he recorded over 3,000 births on his farm, with many of these children being the result of forced breeding. Thistlewood saw the breeding of enslaved people as a way to increase his wealth, noting in his diary that all slaves are profitable, but breeding women more so than men. Another example of the profitability of slave breeding can be seen in the story of Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, two slave traders who operated in Alexandria, Virginia. Franklin and Armfield specialized in the slave trade and made a fortune by buying and selling slaves. They also engaged in the practice of slave breeding, and Franklin is estimated to have fathered over 600 children with female slaves in his possession. These children were then sold or traded for a profit. In addition to these records, there are numerous other historical documents that provide striking evidence to these barbaric practices. For example, advertisements for slave auctions often highlighted the breeding capabilities of enslaved women, with phrases such as prolific breeders or good breeders being used to describe them. These advertisements serve as a stark reminder of the inhumane and exploitative nature of the slave trade. Fact number seven. Plantation owners would hire doctors to oversee the breeding of enslaved people and to treat any medical issues that arose. While it may seem paradoxical for doctors, who are supposed to be healers, to oversee the breeding of enslaved people, this was a common practice on many plantations during the antebellum period. Plantation owners would hire doctors to ensure that enslaved women were healthy enough to breed and to treat any medical issues that arose during the breeding process. One particularly notorious example of this was Dr. J. Marion Sims, who is often referred to as the father of modern gynecology.
Sims performed a number of experimental surgeries on enslaved women in the mid-1800s, including surgeries to repair fistulas, a condition that often occurred during childbirth. Sims conducted these surgeries without anesthesia, as he believed that enslaved people did not experience pain in the same way as white people. His work on fistulas led to the development of new surgical techniques, but it came at a great cost to the enslaved women who were subjected to his experiments. In addition to performing surgeries, doctors were also responsible for ensuring that enslaved women were healthy enough to produce offspring. This often involved monitoring their diets and treating any illnesses that could affect their ability to conceive. However, it's important to note that this care was not provided out of concern for the well-being of the enslaved people, but rather to ensure that they were able to produce more enslaved people for the plantation owner's profit. Fact number eight. Enslaved women on sex farms were often given inadequate nutrition and health care, leading to high rates of infant mortality. While fertile women were considered valuable and used as reproductive machines to produce more slaves on sex farms, the living conditions on these farms were not any better, and as a result, many infants did not survive. Enslaved women on sex farms were forced to work long hours in the fields, which meant that they were not able to take care of their babies as they should. The infants were often malnourished and sickly, and the women had no access to proper medical care to help them. This would contribute to the high rates of infant mortality as at that time. One example of this is the case of the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola Prison. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, Angola Prison had a large population of enslaved women who were forced to work on a sex farm. The women were subjected to brutal treatment and were given little food and water. They were also denied medical care and were forced to give birth in filthy conditions, which led to high rates of infant mortality. In a report published by the American Public Health Association in 1915, it was noted that the infant mortality rate at Angola Prison was 75%. This means that out of every four infants born on the farm, only one survived. This is a staggering statistic and shows just how dire the situation was for these women and their children. Unfortunately, Angola Prison was not the only place case. Many other sex farms across the country had similarly high rates of infant mortality. The women who were forced to work on these farms were subjected to unimaginable cruelty, leading to the death of their babies. Fact number nine. The practice of slave breeding and sex farms continued even after the abolition of slavery. Even after the abolition of slavery, the practice of slave breeding and sex farms continued in some parts of the United States. While the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolished slavery in 1865, it did not prohibit the practice of slave breeding or sexual exploitation of former slaves. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that the practice of slave breeding continued in some parts of the South well into the early 20th century. This was due in part to the fact that many former slaves continued to work on the same plantations where they had been enslaved and were still subject to the same exploitative and abusive conditions. One of the most well-known cases of post-abolition slave breeding occurred in Natchez, Mississippi. Between the late 1860s and the early 1900s, Wealthy white planters in the area engaged in a system of fancy trade where they would buy and sell young, light-skinned African-American women who were specifically bred for their physical appearance and sexual appeal. These women, known as fancy girls, were often the daughters of mixed-race slaves and were sold at auction for exorbitant prices. They were then forced into sexual relationships with white plantation owners and their male guests and their offspring were often sold back into the slave trade. In addition to the fancy trade, there were also reports of forced sexual relationships between white plantation owners and their former female slaves. This was made easier by the fact that many former slaves continued to live and work on the same plantations where they had been enslaved and were often still subjected to the same abusive treatment. Fact number 10. Slave breeding and sex farms were often defended by slave owners and supporters of slavery. Despite the horrific and exploitative nature of slave breeding and sex farms, many slave owners and supporters of slavery defended the practice as necessary for the economic prosperity of the American South. They argued that the breeding of enslaved people was an important source of labor for the plantation economy.
and that without it, the region would suffer economically. For example, in his 1857 book The Impending Crisis of the South, Southern writer and politician Hinton Rowan Helper defended the practice of slave breeding as a necessary economic strategy. He wrote that, The raising of Negroes for the Southern market has been carried on to a considerable extent and that it has proved to be a lucrative and profitable business. Similarly, in a speech delivered in 1850, U.S. Senator James Henry Hammond of South Carolina defended the practice of slave breeding as necessary for the economic success of the Southern states. He argued that the breeding of enslaved people was a more cost-effective way of acquiring labor than importing new slaves from Africa or purchasing them from other regions. These justifications for slave breeding and sex farms highlight the deep-seated racism and economic interests that underpinned the institution of slavery. Rather than acknowledging the inhumane and exploitative nature of the practice, slave owners and their supporters saw enslaved people solely as a source of labor without regard for their basic human rights and dignity. Furthermore, these justifications ignore the fact that enslaved people were not merely property or commodities, but were human beings with families, cultures, and histories. By treating enslaved people solely as sources of labor, slave owners and supporters of slavery perpetuated a system of exploitation and dehumanization that continues to have lasting impacts on American society. While it may be difficult to confront the reality of what happened on sex farms during slavery, it's important that we acknowledge and remember these atrocities in order to fully understand the impact that slavery has had on American society. The practice of slave breeding was not only inhumane but also dehumanizing, as it reduced human beings to nothing more than commodities to be bought, sold, and traded. The evidence of this practice is overwhelming and it is important to learn from this dark chapter in history. By acknowledging the deep-seated racism and exploitation that underpinned these practices and working to dismantle the systems of inequality and injustice that continue to affect black Americans, we can begin to create a more just and equitable society for all. Thanks for watching. Do not forget to like and hit the subscribe button to catch more content like this.